नमस्ते सतीश जी वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन थैंक यू सो मच माई प्लेजर टू बी विद यू इन दिस कन्वर्सेशन thank you thank you so much now in your case my gosh the story is so big but i thought that it's best to start at the beginning uh where you grew up as a jain and is so is it being a jain boy who was being trained to be a jain a monk that is your first introduction to the idea of non violence or was it something else No, no. It was the first idea of non-violence because for the Jains, ahimsa paramo dharma, ahimsa is the highest um, form of spirituality. Right. Because um, even truth comes second, ahimsa first, because right. truth can be sharp, mm. truth can hurt, truth can uh, can kind of. upset people and that's non not non violence so mm. i was taught as a jain monk even to think non violently yeah. speak non violently and yeah. act non violently that was my training and right. my guru taught me a shloka mm. satyam bruyat priyam bruyat ma bruyat satya ma priyam that means that even when you speak you speak sweetly sweet words are non violent words if you speak violent words harsh words upsetting words that's violence you do not hurt anybody's feeling yeah. be hurting somebody's feeling is violence that was the training of a jain monk and for 9 years i was in that training from what age to what age i became a jain monk at age 9 Okay, and I was a Jain monk up to the age of eighteen, so uh, nine years of right. practice. Right. And and as a Jain monk, I will eat only once in twenty four hours. I see. So I see. you minimize how much you take from nature, right? Because right. when you take right. something from nature, even your food has to be taken, but it is it is a kind of taking life. um yeah. even vegetables although jains are all vegetarians no yeah. meat no fish no eggs um but even what you take from nature is taking so taking minimum so once a day in 24 hours i was eating vegetarian food as a practice of non violence but how does the jain tradition deal with the fact that all life subsists on life after all yeah yeah right so would it be fair to say that in this human existence when we are embodied yeah. beings absolute non violence is not possible is that a fair no, statement absolute non violence is possible okay but How non violence far? is non violence is primarily based on your intention oh and your motivation so if you are life is a gift to life jeevo jeevasya jeevanam so life is a gift to life so a mother goes through pain and suffering and giving birth to a child there is a you can say there is a pain there is a suffering but that's not violence because she gives birth with love and compassion and kindness um, to a child to bring life into the world so a tree a mango tree gives fruit so that birds and animals and humans can be fed and nourished and nurtured mm. with their fruit so nature is generous nature is kind nature is non violent nature yeah. is compassionate and nature gives life to maintain life but violence comes when you are not receiving as a gift but you are receiving it as a right and you take more than you need and you you, you practice cruelty and you practice un- lack of compassion this is why meat eating is forbidden in jain tradition because you don't need it yeah take what is your real need yeah and take it with gratitude and yeah. with kindness and compassion and offer back something to nature 
like um, planting trees or watering trees or, or nurturing soil or making soil be sustainable and building soil. All these things giving back. So taking something, giving back. So principle of nonviolence is based on reciprocity. You take from nature and give back something to nature. So taking food is not violence. Making clothes is not violence. Building a house is not violence. But when you cut down one tree, you say, thank you tree for giving me your body to make my home. I am grateful. And then you plant five trees so that trees can grow. So that is non-violence. Jain non-violence is not uh, um, right. just uh, not taking. Jain violence is your mind, your yeah. consciousness, your thinking. Okay. What is your motivation? What is your intention? That is determining factor of non-violence. So on that front, uh, there is the issue of uh, how do we distinguish between our needs and wants. And that yes. for some people, uh, the process of separating needs from wants or even being aware that this is a want, but yeah. uh, you know, not wanting to curb it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because there are people who say that, oh, I'm doing violence to myself because I'm excessively limiting my wants. How do we process yeah. this dilemma? No, no, no. That is not violence to yourself. Okay. Jane, non-violence is to love yourself, mm -hmm. respect yourself, take care of yourself. Because if you don't love yourself, you how can you love somebody else? If you are not non-violent to yourself, how can we non-violent to others? So again, it's a motivation. Yeah. If I am taking something from nature, what is the difference between need and greed? Mm. Need and want. The difference is that when I take from nature, I take only to meet my minimum needs. Minimalism yeah. Yeah. is necessary. Minimalism, not maximalism. So if I need one or two pairs of a shirt, that's fine. But if you have a wardrobe full of shirts, that's not fine. So ahimsa also in Jain tradition goes with aparigraha. Mm -hmm. Aparigraha is to minimize your possessions. If mm -hmm. you have one house, a small, beautiful house, elegant house, comfortable house, that is fine. Jains don't object to that. But if you have more than one house or a too big house, have an empty room sitting there just for your glory and your glamour and your a kind of um, um, pompous living, that is violence. So Aparigraha and Ahimsa are the twins. They go together. So if you are practicing non-violence, you also need to practice Aparigraha. So take what is from nature needed, give something back, reciprocity, mutuality, but the greed is when you want to more, more, more. And, yes. never and, and that the more is driven by competition with others. Exactly. Exactly. So competition yeah. is not yeah. non-violence. So <clears throat> it's, it's, a, it's, it's a contentment. Yeah. Ahimsa and aparigraha also require santosh. Hmm. And santosh means contentment. I have one body and that's good. I have a few clothes. That's good. I have a small house. Elegant, beautiful, simple, nicely made, beautifully uh, crafted. That's very nice. So beauty and usefulness and durability. These are Jain principles. So do you consider yourself a Jain even today? <coughs> Sorry. I was born as a Jain. Right. And therefore, I practice non-violence. And that is a mark of a Jain. But I am not so sectarian Jain. Yeah. There are two kinds of Jains. One is a spiritual Jain and the other is a sectarian Jain. Mm -hmm. Sectarian Jain would say Jain image is better than any other religion. That is sectarian. If you say um, you have to become a Jain, if, unless you are Jain, you have no salvation. That's a sectarian. I am not so keen on the labels. I'm not so keen on sectarian Jainism, but I am a Jain in a spiritual way because Jain means being humble, being kind and respecting other people. So if you are a Hindu, you are a Muslim, you are a Buddhist, you are a Christian, I still respect you. Disrespect to others is violence. And if you are practicing non-violence of the mind, non-violence in your consciousness, non-violence in your spirit, non-violence your words, 
then you respect Christians and Buddhists and, and Hindus and, and all other religions. So respecting, there's no one truth in Jain tradition. Jains, Jains believe in anekant, no one truth, anekant, plurality of truths. Like we believe in biodiversity, cultural diversity, we believe in religious diversity, we believe in um, uh, racial diversity. Jains also add to that truth diversity. Anekant, it's very important. Ahimsa, aparigraha, then anekant, they are all connected. If you say this is only truth, one truth, only truth, my truth, that's a violence. Allowing all people to practice their own truth. That's a compassion. That's a kindness. That's a generosity of heart. And that truth, biodiversity is good, but truth diversity is also good. And that's a Jain contribution uh, that we believe in many truths. And therefore, there's no sectarianism in true Jainism. So I'm not a sectarian Jain. I'm a spiritual Jain. Wonderful. Uh, so maybe this is a good point to go back to the chronology of your life because uh, when you came out of uh, this uh, phase of being a Jain monk, you became a peace activist and you walked all the way from, uh, I think, Delhi, yes. right, uh, to London and then you sailed to America where I think again you walked. Yeah. Basically, you walked around the world, if I'm, if I remember correctly. That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah. For peace. Now, walking. And... Gigi, go yeah. ahead. Walking is also a Jain practice, mm -hmm. because all monks, as a Jain monk, <clears throat> I always walked for nine years. No train. No plane. No car. No bicycle. Not even a bullock cart. Mm -hmm completely walking on your two legs. And so that's the practice I had. So I knew that you can walk. And so um, when I wanted to walk for peace, that was my calling because I was um, uh, thinking that uh, these nuclear weapons and war preparation and arms race, that is the greatest symbol of violence in the world. What more violent there can be more than a nuclear bomb, which will kill not only your enemies, but all humans uh, under the under the kind of uh, roof and, and under this the kind of sun. Um, men, women, children, trees, animals, birds, everything is destroyed. So that's the greatest violence. So I decided to walk from the grave of Mahatma Gandhi, who was one of the greatest symbol and greater apostle of non-violence, so I started from the grave of Mahatma Gandhi in Rajghat, New Delhi. And then I walked through uh, India to Baga border. Then I walked through Pakistan, uh, Lahore, Rawalpindi, Peshawar, over the Khyber Pass, and then into Afghanistan. And I walked to Kabul and over the Hindu Kush mountains up to about 12,000 feet high mountains and a lot of blisters, and a lot of uh, um, knee pain, and all that. And sometimes uh, I, I remain vegetarian. And so sometimes I had to be go hungry, or eat just bread and tea, nothing else, or some fruit. And then I walked through the desert of Iran, and then I walked through Azerbaijan, and Armenia, and Georgia, and, and through the snow-covered village of Russia, and then to Moscow, and I was received in the Kremlin, uh, about uh, about uh, nuclear disarmament that I talked. And then I walked through Belorussia, Poland, Germany, Belgium, France. And then with the help of some pacifists in uh, France, I took a boat from uh, Calais to Dover. And then I walked from Dover to London, London to Southampton. And then I was uh, given um, two tickets uh, uh, with my friend E.P. Menon and I was walking, two of us. And so we were given two tickets in a boat called the Queen Mary. And we sailed across the Atlantic from Southampton to New York. And then we walked from New York to Washington, D.C. And we ended our journey at the grave of John F. Kennedy. And that was very symbolic because starting from the grave of Mahatma Gandhi, who was a a, a, a victim of uh, of the bullet of an assassin. He was killed by a gun. And also Kennedy was killed by a gun. 
And so I was making the point that if you believe in the gun, gun not only kills a bad human being, a gun also kills a Gandhi or a Kennedy. So don't believe in violence. Don't believe in the gun. Believe in peace. And then I was, so that was 8,000 miles long peace pilgrimage. And I did it as a Jain monk because as a kind of aparigraha, no money at all. Not yeah. a single rupee. Not a How single did you come dollar, back? Not a single um, a cent. How did you come back then? I came back with the courtesy of um, people in every country. So I, I walked from in Japan, from Tokyo to Hiroshima. That was another symbol of peace and nonviolence uh, to protest against the, um, the bombing of Hiroshima. And then Japanese people uh, gave us two tickets in a boat. And so from Yokohama uh, to Bombay, uh, we sailed and we came uh, back by boat. And they now, were given to us by Japanese hosts. Wonderful. If I'm uh, not mistaken, it was Bertrand Russell who paid for your passage from Southampton to New York, wasn't it? That's right. That's right. And so can you when tell we, us when we, something when about we met, huh? When we met Bertrand Russell, huh? he said huh? to us that you have walked from India to England without any any money, that I can understand. It's a great thing to do, but it's all land, so you could walk. But you can't walk over the Atlantic. How are you going to get there? So can I give you some money? He offered us some money. But I said, Lord Russell, we have not touched money for two years. And so we don't want any money. But if you would like to help us with two tickets in, uh, in a boat, and we don't want to fly, we'll will go by boat. So he helped us to, to raise money and, and collect money. And so he helped us to get two tickets in the Queen Mary. So can you recall something more about your meeting with Lord Russell? Uh, because he was a leading pacifist of his time. He was lobbying even then against nuclear weapons. What do you recall about your meeting with him? I was most inspired by his personality and his total and utter commitment to peace and nonviolence and disarmament. Um, although I did say to him that nonviolence and peace are more than absence of war. Mm -hmm. Nonviolence and peace are a way of life. Whereas Bertrand Russell was more kind of uh, fighting for stopping wars. Uh, absence of war was for uh, Russell more important. But for me, uh, peace and nonviolence go much further than just absence of war, because you can have institutionalized violence, you can have industrial violence, you can have violence in agriculture, you can have violence in our economic system. And yeah. so social injustice is, uh, is violence. So uh, racialism, uh, racism is violence. Many, many kind of violence comes in many, many forms. So although Bertrand Russell was also very sympathetic to all those things, uh, and he was the most uh, liberal minded and most peace minded person. Of course, I also met Martin Luther King after my finishing uh, the journey at the grave of John F. Kennedy. I also met Martin Luther King and he was another like great uh, uh, Lord Bertrand Russell, he was another great pacifist and a great um, um, uh, activist. And he was most inspired by Mahatma Gandhi. When I met him uh, in his um, room, uh, behind his desk, there was a big, nice picture of Mahatma Gandhi. And he said, he is my inspiration for nonviolent resistance uh, in America and how we can make uh, um, um, uh, more racial equality in our world with love and with nonviolence. So Martin Luther King was a truly uh, um, an embodiment of nonviolence, a kind of example of nonviolence. He carried no uh, revenge. He carried no um, kind of any kind of anger, no yeah. any kind of anxiety, and no any kind of fear. He was totally fearless. For in his ten years of activism, he was put in jail for twenty nine times. Can you imagine twenty nine times? And yet he carried no revenge and no anger, he was full of love, and yet firm and totally committed and totally uh, dedicated to end racism. 
that is a kind of combination of that um, uh, uh, um, that kind of radical uh, activism and complete nonviolence and peace. That combination was quite amazing and very inspiring. Yeah. Can you say a bit more about this concept of radical love, which uh, Martin Luther King so much embodied? You know, this idea that, uh, uh, which Gandhi used to also say, right? that we cannot be liberated unless the white man, the colo colonialist is also liberated. Because he yes, believed yes. that the oppressor uh, is also suffering such bad karma. Am I right? And, and so when Martin Luther King also often said that the liberation of the African Americans uh, cannot happen unless the white person is also liberated from their absolutely. prejudice. Absolutely. So if you could elaborate a bit on this, that, you know, how absolutely, does one, how absolutely, does one apply yeah. this in your own life? Yes, absolutely. Um, I have also written a book. My new book, the latest book, is called Radical Love. Mm -hmm. And it's published by Parallax Press. Right. And it came out just uh, in February this year. So radical, there are two kinds of love. Moderate love and radical love. Moderate love is to love somebody who loves you back. So you love your wife, you love your husband, you love your children, you love your friends, you love your neighbors, you love people who love you and you expect them to love you and you expect them to be good. You expect them to be nice. You ex expect them to be a kind of open-minded. And so there's an expectation in that love. That's what I call moderate love. And the radical love is that you love without any expectation, without any condition. And you love even those who are your opponents. Mm. You love even those who may not um, be good in your view, who might be practicing colonialism, racism, uh, sexism, uh, um, uh, uh, any kind of materialism, imperialism, uh, any kind of ism which you don't like. And you still love them. Yeah. So that is a radical love. And, and the Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and also James Mahavir, the founder, and all these people were practicing radical love, radical nonviolence, yeah. so that you are not kind and compassionate to those who you like, but you have a kind of alchemy of love. And you only through love, you can transform an enemy into a friend. There's no other way. Yeah. By weapons and violence, by yeah. guns and bombs, you can kill your enemy. You can kill one, two, hundred, thousand, a million. But you can't transform them. But in order to transform an enemy into a friend, and imp like imperial British, Mahatma Gandhi transformed them into friends. Now, yeah. Indians and British are friends. And Martin Luther King transformed the white people into friends. And now um, Obama, a black man, could be in the White House and, and serve a white nation and a black nation and an and and American Indian nation. All nations are served equally. So yeah. that is radical love. When you are able to work uh, and transform um, yourself, and transform your opponent uh, with the alchemy of love. That is the alchemy of love. Alchemy is to transform base metal into gold. Yes. So alchemy is to transform an enemy into friend. Yeah. That is the reason that Mahatma Gandhi and Martha King and, and, and ancient times from my own Jain tradition, we have always advocated radical love, radical nonviolence, not the kind of moderate love that I love you and you love me back. That's a simple and easy. That's good. There's yeah. nothing wrong with that. But we need to go a step further and a little bit more radical. Yeah, yeah. And you've been doing this. I mean, you know, since that walk, which is what now, I think 60 years ago, um, you have actually, I think, tre tre tread on this path, uh, both in your capacity as editor of Resurgence magazine, uh, in many other roles uh, as, a, as a director of the programs at uh, Schumacher College. Now, after this long innings of so much rich work, in the world around you, what is your assessment at the moment? I mean, is, is, <laughs> you know, is, is racism, for example, on the decline 
or are we still seeing it around in more ways than uh, we could have expected given that so much has been done to change it you you know i am an activist and also i am an optimist i don't feel pessimism yeah and i think if you want to be an activist you have to be a pessimist no sorry sorry <laughs> if you want to be an activist you have to be an optimist if yes. you are a pessimist you cannot be an activist you might become a journalist if you are a pessimist you can be a journalist maybe but not an activist so i see the things have changed if you take 50 years ago what was the state of women in india or europe or america very poor now women have a much more um uh, place in the society and much higher status and more recognition than before what obama could not be president at 50, 20, 30 40 50 years ago when martin luther king was fighting for uh, the end of racism and and when he, the british empire never ended um, anywhere the sun never ended um under british empire yeah but uh, now where is the british empire <laughs> and and the soviet union disappeared berlin wall disappeared apartheid disappeared um, and nelson mandela became free after 27 years in jail he became is... free and a president of uh, new south africa so oh. many many things have changed because that's of non violence that's true that's true they yeah. have uh, and yet since i have attended many of your talks i know that you also have a very searing critique of the world in which we live today Yes. and 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 you have constantly been uh, uh, drawing attention to the many forms of structural violence yes. that are undermining the quality of life on this planet yes. so yes. how are you feeling today um, in the sense that i know you're an optimist you've already established that but uh, what do you see as the hope for overturning the structural violence that is afflicting us yes. see the the establishment of non violence is a pilgrimage it is a journey like when you are climbing mount everest you have climbed say 20000 feet but there is still um, a few thousand uh, feet more to go so in the same way we have come a long way in bringing an uh, end to racism sexism colonialism imperialism and many other things and and now world is much closer and many many more people are uh, like taking care of each other so there are many good things have happened but there's a long way to go there's still a long way to go we have not come to a state where everybody is practicing non violence still america spends so much money on armaments and weapons and pentagon if you put the whole world together and the the cost of armaments and the budget for military and and bombs uh, in one side of whole world and the other side of america only america spend more money on weapons and armaments and military and pentagon than the rest of the world together that's not a good state so i'm very radical now i want to say to america don't spend so much money when even your own countrymen are poor they are living in slums they are they are sleeping in the street they have no education they have no medicine and you are spending money on your weapons in the same way india and china and pakistan they can come together and say we are neighbors we cannot change location we cannot change geography let's find a way to have a negotiated peace and settlement between pakistan and india between china and india so those kind of things are continuing and we have to go on being radical and be activist and work better and better and better uh, for a society where everybody can live in peace and everybody can live in non violence and nobody has to go for uh, weapons and military and nuclear weapons that is the world i want to see and this is why i am still active at the age of 86 I'm fighting for peace. I'm fighting for non-violence. Yeah, absolutely. And every year, you work closely with a new cohort of students who come to Shumaka College, whether it is to do the short course or to do the MSc. So now, by now, over see the college is not about twenty-five years old now, almost. so you have seen i think now two generations of young people pass through 
what is your hope from them? Because on these are young people who have a predisposition. They come to Schumacher College because they are already committed to working for nonviolent means. Uh, so what are some of the signs of hope that you see in these young people whom you have mentored? At Schumacher College, we have received more than 15,000 students from all over the world. And you are one of them. And when our students leave the college, I always advise them that when you go in the world, don't look for a job. Don't seek employment, but create your own job. Because most of the jobs you get in the world today are very violent. Our jobs are very violent to nature. We exploit nature. We damage nature. We harm nature. Whereas our job should be to enhance nature and enhance human conditions. At the moment, we in the world see nature only as a resource for the economy, natural resources. Whereas at Schumacher College, we are teaching our young people to um, see nature not as a resource for the economy, but as a source of life itself. This is the, the most important uh, uh, lesson that I teach at Schumacher College. And also, uh, we teach, treat uh, humans as a resource. Uh, various businesses have department for HR. HR means human resources. I say this is not right. Humans are not a resource for economy. Humans are not a resource for making money. Humans are not a resource for making profit and running business. Humans have a dignity. Humans have rights. So um, nature is a life source. Humans have a dignity. And therefore, violence is to use humans as a resource and use nature as a resource and only profit and making money and production and consumption and economic growth. That is a violent, um, institutionalized, structural violence that we have in a society. And so the work of Schumacher College is to remove that kind of structural violence and institutionalized violence and create work which has a human dignity, which do, does no harm to people, there's no harm to nature, there's no harm to society, and no harm to yourself. That's the kind of ideal we are working. It's a long way to go, and I don't think we can achieve it tomorrow. It takes time, but we have to work for an ideal. If you have no ideal, if you are not trying to climb the Mount Everest and go to the top, then you don't have adventure. So it's a journey of adventure. It's a journey of pilgrimage, and we are working at Schumacher College, and we are working for Research and Trust, and Resurgence magazine to go to that ideal. We may never reach it, but still it's worth trying to go there. So what advice would you give to young people <clears throat> who are very drawn to nonviolence, but, and this is true for people across the world, they may be drawn to nonviolence, but they feel overwhelmed. They feel the odds are so much against them. Uh, what would you suggest or advise them by way of, qualities, inner qualities that they can cultivate yes, to yes. stay on this path. I would like to say to young people that do not underestimate, do not undervalue, and do not underrate your enormous capacity. Each and every one of you, the young people, have enormous potential. You have been given by the universe great qualities. Every one of you have imagination. Every one of you have uh, creativity. Every one of you have courage. The word courage comes from heart. Kur means heart. Courage is heart quality. And all of us have heart. All of you have been given love in your heart and compassion and feelings and power to think and power to act and power to build and power to create. So we have what we need. You don't, you don't have to go to a shopping mall uh, or cannot place or somewhere uh, to buy courage. Courage is in you. So use your courage, use your imagination, use your capacity and do something which will satisfy and fulfill your ambition and your ideals. Mahatma Gandhi was a man like you and me, a person like you and me. 
with two hands, two arms, two legs, short, um, uh, broken teeth. Um, uh, what was the, uh, I mean, he was hungry. He ate food. He was um, uh, tired. He went to sleep. He was like you and me. But he allowed his courage to come out. Martin Luther King, the same. Um, all the artists, Picasso. Uh, Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, Tolstoy, um, uh, the Buddha, Mahavira, all those great names that we take, they were all like you and me once a young man. But they all used their courage and their imagination and their creativity to do something good for the world and something good for themselves. So I would ask all young people not to underestimate their capacity. Every person is a potential leader. A leader is not a special kind of person, but every person, every young person is a special kind of leader. So cultivate your leadership qualities and lead the world to a better place so that we have a minimal violence, minimal racism, minimal uh, materialism and maximum love and compassion and kindness and humanity and generosity and arts and culture and music and poetry and many, many wonderful other things we can have. When we can have all those wonderful things in our life, why to go for anger and fear and bombs and weapons and military and violence and killing and, and injustice? We don't need all those things. We can have beautiful things in our lives and it's in our hands to bring all those beautiful things in the world. You know, this reminds me of something that I recall from uh, E.F. Schumacher's book, The Guide for the Perplexed, where he says that one of the problems of our times is that we are taught to be skeptical of everything but skepticism itself. Yes. And uh, it, I, this is what I'm hearing you say, that in a sense, uh, what I'm you know, receiving from what you've said is that, you know, let us not be victims of excessive skepticism. Keep the faith. Absolutely. Keep, Keep the, the faith. faith. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You have to have a faith. You have to have a trust in yourself. If yes. you don't trust yourself, you don't believe in yourself. You don't believe in your capacity and your potential. You can't do anything. So you have the capacity. So I would like every young person to think that they are the CEO of their own lives <laughs> and take control of your own life and do something which you are capable of doing, but you are just uh, undervaluing yourself. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe this means that you need to free yourself from the sense of Measuring yourself in comparison to others, is that an issue? Not comparison to others. Uh, just you can have some ideals. As mm. an example, uh, like uh, Mahatma Gandhi was an example. And, and we follow uh, such example. Martin Luther King was an example. Tolstoy was an example. Shakespeare was an example. There are many, many world, uh, uh, even in our Indian culture, we have many, many Shankaracharya. For example, Vivekananda, for example, Aurobindo, for example. These are Ma Ananda Mai, for example. These are great examples of spiritual and, and political and social figures who can inspire us. Kalidas, you can be a Kalidas and write good poetry. You can be whoever you want to be. So these are ideals to inspire us. But we have to find our own way. We are not copying somebody. We yeah. want to be ourselves but our true selves. And when you beat your true self, you can be self-realized. Is there anything that you would like to add that I have I not think we have, we have covered everything. And it's my pleasure uh, to be in conversation with you and talk okay. about non-violence. Non-violence of mind, non-violence of speech, non-violence in action, non-violence everywhere. That is the best way. But non-violence is democratic. Violence yes is not democratic. Only a few people can use bombs and guns and military. But as a non-violence, everybody can practice. So the more democratic um, way to live and act is non-violent action. Action. Thank you so much. God bless My you. My pleasure. Ji, ji. Bahut, bahut shukriya. Thank you. My pleasure. And we'll see you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah,